Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of science fiction and all its often impossible dynamism to you, the viewer. Today we're going to be diving back into Battlestar Galactica to cover one of the most iconic fighter designs in science fiction and one of the few space fighters that I personally really, really like. The Viper and its evolution from the Mark 1 through 7. We'll be covering their history, background, and usage during the Cylon Wars. But first, if you'd like to support Psy directly, then check out our Patreon, and if space bucks are short, then like, sub, share the video around, and all that, since every little bit helps, and your AI overlord demands your patronage. Plus, if you're interested in a community of like-minded turbo nerds and geeks, then check out Psy's Discord server linked in the description. We can hang out, share sci-fi stuff, and bond over hobbies and bad memes. Also, I'm streaming on the 24th, Armored Core, Day 1, Come Watch Me Suck at Max Souls. And with that, let's move on to this absolute beauty. The Viper. To most who only know vaguely of Battlestar Galactica, or only ever really watched one of the series, the original or the remake, you will immediately think of the Mark I, or the two, maybe the seven, but you know, there's a lot more than just those two ships in the Viper's glorious lineage. There's seven, clearly. Except, not really. There are a few skipped generations here and there, but that's not super important. Oh, also, I should feel that I need to mention right at the beginning, I will be drawing from the RDM version, as well as a little bit from Battlestar Galactica Deadlock, since they are the most recent and most canon of all the Battlestar Galactica stuff. Before we get into the different models of Viper, allow me instead to discuss a little about what their role was in the Colonial Fleet, since they fill a genuinely pretty unique role as far as fighters go in sci-fi, and when I say really unique and kind of cool, I do mean really unique and really cool since you almost never see this in sci-fi. Colonial Viper Squad's most important duty, at least early on in the vessel's iterative life, was to be a fundamental part of their parent vessel or fleet's defensive screen. While the main guns of a ship such as a Jupiter or Artemis-class Battlestar can ward off any larger vessels and are excellent at establishing no-fly zones as well as poking as many holes as possible in Cylon ships, smaller craft and more agile or advanced guided missiles could pose a threat by maneuvering to the undefended sides of said ships before the guns could reasonably turn to stop them. So the Viper's role, especially early on, was to intercept enemy fighter craft, but that's not it, that's not the unique part. Their job was also to intercept incoming enemy munitions and warheads. The ships were so fast and so agile by design that they could keep up with Cylon warheads and shoot them out of the void before they ever had the chance to pose a threat to colonial capital ships. Battlestar Galactica's Vipers are some of the only times I have ever seen fighter craft used to actively seek out and shoot down incoming ordnance. Most of the time you would expect it to be things like ship-mounted point defense weapons or interceptor missiles or some kind of dedicated vessel specifically for doing that that's larger, you know, like a corvette kind of thing like you'd see in Star Wars. However, the unique challenges of Battlestar Galactica's lore, i.e. the toasters doing horrible, horrible things to your electronics means that generally advanced guided munitions are not really used by the Colonials, so they had to find a really cool interesting stopgap way to counter these advanced munitions that the Cylons could still be using. And thus, the Viper would chase them down and kill them. Something, something, snake, hunting down rats, something, something, insert clever joke. Of course, the Viper evolved over the course of its life, mounting heavier weapons, external and internal missile or bomb racks, and gradually transitioning into a multi-role strike fighter that could still serve as a linchpin in a defensive line, but was also extremely effective at taking the fight directly to enemy warships and either treating them to a point-blank taste of the sun through nuclear munitions, or simply posing a huge danger by disabling the guns and systems aboard enemy ships or targeting their engines if they manage to break through the enemy raider forces. Not to mention that the design of the Viper with its stubby little wings on the side that would in no way allow for atmospheric flight but fly in atmosphere and is an amazing utility and support role for any colonial forces on the ground. Should Cylons invade, they would be able to very rapidly deploy onto the 
I was gonna say onto the surface, but no, into the atmosphere of a planet and provide close range missile and gunfire support. And since they're so maneuverable, they're excellent to deploy in extremely dangerous areas like around cities, in extremely rough terrain, or even in forested areas where their incredible speed and their maneuvering thrusters would allow them to get in close to support the infantrymen rather than being forced to stay at a distance. And with all that talk of in-atmosphere fighting, let's move on to where the Viper came from, and surprisingly enough, its legacy doesn't actually start in space. The earliest example we have of something carrying the Angry Snake's name is actually an atmospheric, air-sucking jet fighter craft from before the colonial age, where the Twelve Colonies of Man were disunited warring factions. Developed by the Capricorn Air Force little under a decade before the Cylon Rebellion, this version of the Viper was a more standard air superiority fighter as we would understand it in the modern day. Although, I have to admit, the idea of some Capricorn pilot strapping rocket boosters to his jet, aiming it straight up and yeeting himself right into orbit is hilarious and fits the Capricorn mentality of doing because they can without thinking of if they should and there's no wonder where that mentality gets them, hmm. But moving on to the venerable Mark I. Now this is where a lot of the lore from the original series mashes up into the RDM remake and current canon. While the Viper Mark I served as the standard space superiority fighter of the Colonials during the beginning of the Cylon War, we see it as not only entirely ubiquitous across all 12 of the Colonies of Man, but also catered to in the design of all or most major starships due to the standardized launch tubes and maintenance bays that they used. While the Viper Mark I was used in the Cylon War, it never states explicitly that it was designed expressly for it, yet we see it as the default for everything, so this is the only part where I'm going to insert my own headcanon in order to reconcile this disparity in introduction dates and appearances in canon properties like Battlestar Galactica Deadlock. And this is a symptom of Deadlock rewriting some of the lore to merge the original series into the canon timeline by simply making them older ships. The Mark I was most likely a design created before the Cylon Rebellion, meant as yet another weapons program by one of the colonies in order to one-up the other, as the pre-United Colonies era still had inter-system conflict, skirmishes, and wars like I mentioned, some even persisting into the Rebellion and the First Cylon War because we cannot stop killing each other even when the Toasters try to do it for us. And speaking of Toasters, once they realized that their meager lives could improve with a little capital G genocide and the colonies found themselves thrown into chaos, the Viper, alongside other more modern capital ship designs such as the Artemis Battlestar, were promptly shared in earnest. The Articles of Colonization and the formation of a united human front necessitated the sharing of technology and resources. Thus, very quickly into the conflict, the Viper found itself as the go-to fighter for turning the toasters back into scrap, its success spreading it across the entirety of the Twelve Colonies and the Colonial Navy as a whole. And in that role, it was extremely effective. The Mark I was heavily armored in comparison with its later iterations, able to shrug off multiple glancing hits and sustaining even the odd direct or critical hit and allowing the pilot to bring the bird, or snake, I guess, back home to be repaired and rearmed. The heavy weight of this armor and the two main guns, the KDM model autocannons, allowed the Viper to engage and destroy Cylon raiders with ease and even inflict light damage to Cylon capital ships. The primary threat to larger vessels, however, was doing critical damage to their main engines by just poking lots of holes in them, or disabling the ship's guns and missile launchers by similarly poking lots of holes in them. Powering all of this were the three massive engines mounted triangularly in the back and giving the ship its classical silhouette. However, even with these massive engines, the Viper Mark I was a slow craft. I'm in comparison to the rest of the Viper models, it was slow, but for the time, it was pretty damn speedy. Against early Cylon Raiders, however, it still had the advantage in speed while matching their firepower and durability. But as newer toaster fighters were developed and iterated upon, the Viper Mark I found itself outclassed. And this is where the iterative design of the Viper starts to come in. Seeing the effectiveness of the Mark I's design, but acknowledging the limitations and weaknesses it had, colonial designers set about improving it. Eventually, this gave rise to the Mark II, and this 
this is when we get to see and enjoy the updated and brilliant look of the Viper from the RDM Galactica series. Glorious, sleek, deadly, and oh so fantastically attractive. I love this thing. It is probably one of the coolest fighters in all of sci-fi. This iteration of the Viper? Mmm, chef's kiss. 12 out of 10. The most notable features, the three engines and the similarly tri-mounted wings, struts, radiate. What were these again? I swear I've heard them explained as like five different things, but from what I know, they're hybrid wings to allow for atmospheric flight and weapon struts to let the cannons have better firing angles and convergence, as well as mounts to stuff missiles and things onto them. You know, Regardless, the Viper Mark II was significantly stripped of its armor, and while this may seem like a hilarious step backwards, the reality was that combat data and first-hand accounts showed that while the Mark I could easily tank some hits, often if a pilot was sighted and locked in by a raider, they could easily put more rounds into the Viper than the ship could withstand in the brief moment of time that the toaster needed to actually put the Viper down. Instead, the armor only realistically allowed for functional survivability against stray shots or rushed attacks, situations that rarely occurred with the Cylons as they were more than willing to simply wait and lose ships in order to inflict damage on the colonial forces which had a much harder time replacing their losses. So instead of leading into a design path that was proven relatively ineffective, the designers of the Mark II stripped most of the armor, leaving only enough to protect from flak, debris, and the shrapnel of exploding starfighters around it. The Mark II was also slightly lengthened and enchonkened to make space for more powerful engines, which will be a running theme throughout this video, and vastly upgraded RCS thrusters, eventually coming in at 8.5 meters long, 4.5 meters wide, and 2.5 tall, give or take. The resulting model still fit the silhouette of the Mark I, allowing it to use the same launch tubes, and much of it used identical parts so logistics could easily swap over. But the Mark II was vastly more maneuverable and significantly faster on the straightaway. This allowed the Mark II to easily outmaneuver the older Raider versions and continue to outmatch the newer developments in toaster based space superiority. Because rule number one of combat you can never die if you never get hit. So simply don't be hit, idiot. By the way, going over my script and my bullet points here, I realize. I am going to say the words Viper and Mark so many times in this video. So here's a challenge to everybody that made it to like the one third mark of the video. Go back to the beginning, get yourself an entire bottle of whiskey and sit down for some shots. Every time I say the words Viper or Mark, you take a shot. I promise you, you'll be dead by the point you get back to this time in the video. Enjoy, I guess. Back to the actual video at hand, despite these massive upgrades, the Viper Mark II wouldn't survive so much as a day off the production lines until its replacement was already being drawn up on the design boards it had just left. You might then ask if the Mark II was so effective that it served for the majority of the first Cylon War and even made up the majority of all the fighters aboard the Galactica when it fled the Holocaust of the colonies, why would they immediately set to replacing it? And the answer is quite simple. As a platform, the Mark I and II were excellent fighters, but they lacked any significant punch. They were specifically designed to intercept enemy fighters and munitions, and that was the sum total of their ability as a platform. As the Colonial War Machine began spooling up to full speed ahead, like the juggernaut it was, ships like the Jupiter-class Battlestar and the advanced support ships were being built in fleet-forming numbers. And as I'm sure everyone who's seen my video on it, shameless self-promotion, knows, the Jupiter gives not a single solitary fuck about anything. More specifically, the Holy Wall of Flak, blessed be its name, meant that most colonial battle fleets had adequate or excellent defense against Cylon raiders and munitions like torpedoes and missiles. This meant that there was suddenly a lot of Vipers in said ship squadrons that didn't need to participate in the defensive screen anymore. 
Unfortunately, since the Mark I and II only carried light auto cannons, they didn't actually have the ability to do appreciable damage to actual Cylon base stars or support ships. And while they could mount weapons underneath the wings in uh, like bomb and missile racks, they weren't very large and often were limited to single fire shots, i.e. you get one missile or one bomb per wing, so make them count. Now, for the most part, the Raptors, often carried alongside as the assault squadrons, could carry tons of munitions. This image of a clearly Texas model Raptor is one of my favorite of all time. It is just covered in guns. This design philosophy is usually really stupid, but I think it's hilarious, so it gets a pass. But as powerful as the Raptors could be loaded out with stuff, they often didn't have the speed or the reaction time to respond to opportunities mid-battle. If part of a Cylon Raider wave was destroyed and there was an opening before they could launch reinforcements, the Raptor simply wasn't fast enough to get through that hole and actually get to the Cylon ships to do some damage. Thus, the Mark III was born with the American anthem playing and the gospel of air superiority tattooed on its hull for the Mark III, the Mark III was faster, stronger, longer, and carrying enough firepower to level cities. You see, we, we already covered the dimensions of the Mark II, right? Roughly 8 meters, 4 meters tall, whatever, right? The Mark III was much larger than its older counterpart. Coming in at just under 4 meters tall, 7 meters wide, and 10.5 and meters long, this thing was so enchunkened compared to the ones that came before that it barely fit into the launch tubes. There was a lot of cases where these things just had to be straight up launched because they wouldn't fit or they were having issues with them in the tubes or they had to do refits to some of the older vessels to actually make them work. So they were very large compared to the other ones. And I would also like to point out the Mark III is not the Mark IIb. There's a lot of confusion that I've seen across forums and toy products and questionably canon stuff out there over the course of my research. There are a lot of people that think that this is similarly the same type of Viper as the Mark II, like they're the same frame, but this one is the B version because it's got different weapons. It's not true. It's an entirely different space frame. It is much larger, the proportions are different, and there is fundamentally different equipment in this thing. The Mark III is very much its own version of the Viper. The aforementioned embiggened size was due to yet more powerful engines, keeping this thing competitive with all of the ones that came before, even though it was larger, but also the extended lower wings and the lengthened main hull. This extra space was to fit heavy munitions and allow the Viper to be customized to fit a wider range of mission profiles. While the Mark III still carried the two standard cannons of the prior versions, under its wings were mounted multiple points for a wide array of munitions, from missiles of the regular and nuclear variety, as well as being able to mount things like sensor probes, gravity and magnetic dropped bombs, and even countermeasures like space chaff, flares, I, I, I don't know what the series uses, but it has them. Alongside the variable mounting, depending on the mission, the Mark III also carried dedicated internal missile racks in the schnoz. These were meant to engage Cylon fighters, and to make sure they couldn't be hacked, they were self-seeking. No communications, no guidance from the launching ship, no way to communicate with the missile, basically at all. Once you get a lock, fire and forget. This did mean that they could be easily confused and defeated by stuff like countermeasures, but they couldn't be hacked and turned back around to kill the launching Viper like so many other missiles that the Colonials used would have done, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why the Colonials trended towards guns, because the Cylons would hijack their missiles and flip them right round. As I'm sure can be attested to by the HMS Trinidad, a very unfortunate British destroyer from World War II that launched the torpedo, it plunked into the water, bobbed back up, flipped right round, proceeded to motor directly into the side of the hull, and explode. Hitting yourself with your own munitions probably sucks. However, back on topic, the Mark III was where the future role of the fighter would be solidified. Older models were dedicated fighters and essentially defensive interceptors, but from now on, the Viper was a multi-role strike craft able to take on any mission needed of it. Most famously, the Mark III was shown in Blood and Chrome and flown by Admiral Adama before he was an admiral. 
This is where the lineage of the Viper ends for the First Cylon War, the Mark I filling in the gap early on with the Mark II taking the torch to carry the Colonials for the majority of the conflict, while the Mark III comes in about halfway to two-thirds through near the end and helps pave the way forward with its heavy firepower. And while we see far more advanced versions of the Viper, we don't actually have any concept art or canon designs for what the Mark IV, V, and VI would actually look like. We do know some tidbits of lore, like vague gestures towards further evolutions of the Viper's design during the decades-long Armistice era, but nothing concrete. Instead, allow me to show you a few fan ideas of what the Mark IV would look like. Essentially, the Battlestar Galactica fanbase has had a ton of ideas to work from. Since we know what the Mark VII and III look like, tons of artists have taken a crack at what the missing three versions could look like, inspired by some of the never-used concept art. I personally am a fan of this one. A mix of the original design with its big chunky engines and the Mark III, almost like this idea of what the Mark IV could be was yet again a larger, faster iteration with the big engines on back, maybe it would have been designed to take the fight to the Cylons instead, nuking their capital ships and shipyards in some anticipated colonial counter-offensive before the armistice was signed, hence why the thing is so much bulkier than most of the other Vipers we've seen. There's also this concept for the Mark VI I found, and this one I really like, and to me might as well be canon, it's essentially a less powerful version of the Mark VII. It's missing a gun on the back, it's slightly smaller, it's equipped with less advanced electronics and computer stuff, and overall it looks sort of like a test bed moving from the older Viper designs to a more computer-reliant and advanced one as it moves forward. It's really nice, I think it would serve perfectly as the Mark VI, so there you go. My pick for the number 4 and number 6, now we're just missing number 5. Off you internet nerds go. Bring me more Vipers, I love it. Alas, however, we shall never know what the canon truly says for these missing marks. And with that, on to the aforementioned Mark VII, the brilliant culmination of the Viper program and the most powerful multi-role fighter ever developed by mankind. There are actually two versions of the Mark VII, the A and B modification. However, for now, we'll cover the A model. This is the default colonial manufacture design. Compared to older versions, the Mark VII actually got smaller. At just under 10 meters long, 5.5 meters wide, and 3 meters tall, the Mark VII is a reasonable amount smaller than the III while maintaining its impressive weapons loadout. Three improved autocannons, one on each wing of the craft, allow it to put a heavy amount of fire downrange, while the same underwing racks for variable munitions have been expanded due to the larger wing surface as well as expanding under the actual main body of the fighter itself. But most notably is the design of the engines in the nose. The next generation of colonial fighter engines propel the Mark VII faster and further than ever before, and by that I mean this thing can pull maneuvers that would turn a person into mama's chunky spaghetti sauce while accelerating fast enough to make your blood feel like concrete. So the Mark VII could fly circles around the older models of Viper with a good pilot at the helm and was an absolute monster in fights. In the nose, as was similar to the modernization of the colonial fleet by this point, instead of carrying internal missiles like its predecessors, the Mark VII instead had the most powerful electronic weapon systems and navigational computers available to the colonials. These were designed to help the Mark VII outmaneuver Cylon fighters, essentially showing the pilot optimal flight patterns and assisting in their maneuvers. Imagine it like activating Matrix mode and pulling some ship-foo bullshit to dance between the Cylon bullets. It never worked though, since it was infected with the Cylon command navigation backdoor and uh, turned the CNP program into a death sentence for every ship utilizing it. And no matter how hard I try, I can never stop the horrid pain in my heart when I think of this series. The goddamn toasters! They cut down this style, this magnificence. They denied us the glory of seeing hundreds, no, 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 thousands of these ships kicking ass. I will never forgive toasters for this. Not but bread in my future forevermore. Oh, wait a minute, I have an oven, never mind. I can just toast stuff in there. Moving on, that was the Mark 7A. And there really isn't a difference between the A and the B, aside from a few visual changes in a different shaped nose due to not having the same computer hardware in there, so they made it a little bit smaller. 
but the reason behind it is fantastic. You see, the 7A was built in colonial shipyards up to spec and with purpose-built parts. The 7B was built by the Pegasus, using its onboard fabrication array. The Pegasus would harvest minerals and recover scrap from its various combat engagements, and the biggest difference that was with the much simpler construction arrays on the Battlestar Pegasus, the Mark 7B had a much less refined look. Raw metal and simple shapes make up its fuselage instead of the more elegant paneling of the 7A while all of the internals remain the same. And we see these in the show and the explanation behind it is that, well, the Pegasus had to replace its destroyed or damaged beyond repair Vipers somehow. It had all the manufacturing arrays on board, so might as well go for it. A really cool piece of lore and world building, though I don't think attention was ever really drawn to it during the scenes where we see that and the characters are talking about it, other than we know that the Pegasus can build starfighters and that it did build replacement Mark 7s. And for the most part, that pretty much sums up this video on the Viper. Everyone from the original to the seventh iterations, at least all of the ones that we know of that are canon, and a few that are questionable. A beautiful ship with a striking silhouette and one of the most iconic fighter craft in all of science fiction, at least to turbo nerds like me, but also a beautiful example of artists taking a design and evolving it in a believable and high quality way over the lifespan of the series. 11 out of 10 would fly to my death fighting the Cylons in this bad boy. And with that, the video is over. However, before we fully end off, I would just like to say a huge thank you to all of Size patrons. Your support is greatly appreciated, with a special thanks to all of the $5 tier patrons. Those being David G, The Original, Augie, Eleven Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, The Other One, Silencer, Vox Apollyon, Phoenix, BT Legend, Electro Boy Eleven, Logan Maynard, Mickey, David Armand, Cree Dome, Robin Stapp, It, Fenrir Striker, Tachi Tukane, He's Dead. Deb, Pixie, Virtus, Fabric 445, and the new guy, Anchovy Bob. Your profile picture may be cute and your name funny, but anchovies are still disgusting. And with that, the video is over. I hope to see you next video, next week, whenever. Regardless, outros are hard. Goodbye.